All right. Uh, Lord, we bless you and we thank you for your mercy. Um, we're in the middle of their first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. And um, thank you for the, uh, we thank you for your, uh, for your love and your mercy that led them uh, and brought converts. And to this day, Lord, we are a blessed, um, blessed to receive the faith through the, uh, this beginning work that Paul and Barnabas did. So make us joyful and, and uh, keep us faithful unto death and help us also to spread the faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to, um, um, let me just, just go ahead and mute everybody for a moment. Um, we're going to be uh, finishing up the first missionary journey. Um, and um, let me see, I'm going to put up the map. Uh, they'll come back to Antioch and report, and then there's trouble in the church, uh, divisions over how to handle Gentile converts. Um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of a familiar ring to it. In effect, it's the ancient version of racism um, that we'll be looking at tonight as we get into Acts 15. It wasn't between black and white, but between Jew and Gentile. But gosh, the similarities are so strong that I think we'll have a lot to learn uh, today uh, about that topic. We've already encountered it, right? How angry they were that Paul went, I mean, that John, Peter went into the house of a stinking Gentile and ate with them and, you know, baptized them, you know. And so we saw, we saw a lot of that already. And he explains and they finally say, well, all right, I guess the Gentiles are now co-heirs. Uh, but um, it's not that simple. Learning to live together is, gonna, is a challenge in the church. So we'll, we'll see all that tonight. But first of all, let me just see if I can share my screen here. Um, why is that not appearing? There was a... Um, that. So where is... For some reason, it's not popping up on mine. Let me try it one more time. Share my screen. There it is. Okay. Now, I hope that, uh, can you see the map well enough? And you, can you kind of wave and tell me if you can, okay, good. So let's review. Um, Paul and Barnabas um, had, um, um, had begun at Antioch. Uh, they, they, they went down to the, uh, to the island of Cyprus and came around the, the lower part of Cyprus doing some evangelizing as they went. Cyprus was kind of a, a, a familiar area to Barnabas, and he'll go back there at some point later in the Acts. They sail across, though, and they land at Perga, and they go up into the mountains to Antioch. They work their way around to Iconium, down to Lystra and Derbe. And then they, they backtrack through those same towns. And in each of the same towns, the basic result is the same. They encounter, they go to a synagogue, they preach, um, and then they, um, they um, encounter resistance, especially from uh, some of the Jews, uh, and they, they, they shake off the dust and go out and preach to the Gentiles, who are much better at responding to the message. Um, these, some, of these, un, uh, some of these Jews, who uh, unbelieving Jews, also um, bottle them when they go from Antioch to Iconium and they incite the mob against them and so on. So uh, there's a real uh, animus against Paul and Barnabas and their work from many Jews, not all Jews. Remember, this is not a all Jews kind of thing. This is a, but there's a, the unbelieving Jews, right? So obviously Paul and Barnabas were Jews. Many of the first converts were Jews. The point isn't the Jews as a group, but the unbelieving Jews. And for whatever reason, Scripture just in shorthand calls them the Jews, okay? This is maybe unfortunate for us today who have seen quite a, an aftermath of centuries of anti-Semitism uh, that led up to what happened in the Second World War, um, but wasn't unique to that period. Uh, even now, there's a resurgence in anti-Semitism um, in many aspects of uh, the world, uh, including our own culture, where we start to see some of these um, uh, movements are uh, extremely, uh, like for example, Minister Louis Farrakhan, he's a, a nation of Islam, very anti-Jewish and, and so on. I won't, we don't want to get into all that, but just 
take note of it, that it may be unfortunate from our point of view that uh, the scripture speaks of the unbelieving Jews as simply the Jews, because many Jews did believe. All right. Now, I'll take down the screen, but I just want to remind you of the basic. It's a kind of a tight circle they make, um, and, uh, but it's a good first mission. All right. So let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 14, where they're at Iconium. So um, we're going to pick the story up there. We may have covered some of this last week, but um, the um, um, a little review won't hurt us. All right. Okay, now uh, I'll, I'll start, and, um, and then if only if you'd like to maybe pick up with a little bit of reading, but I'll start just to kind of get us back into the cycle here. Now at Iconium, they entered uh, into the Jewish synagogue, and they spoke in such a way the great number of both of Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews, so we do have that qualifier here, stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness uh, to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders be done by their hands. Um, but the people of that city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat Paul and Barnabas and stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, the cities of uh, Lycania and the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Now, uh, a couple things here. We see that... Um, um, it says that they remained there for a long time. Luke is famous for being vague about time. But what we do know is that this first missionary journey is pretty easily dated to um, about 40, between 44 and 46 AD. So this, this first missionary journey was two years. So we could presume that maybe they spent, you know, a good number of months, uh, maybe even six months or more, uh, in an Iconium. Um, exactly what he means by a long time is less clear, but just, just don't think of them as just kind of walking into a town, kind of going to the local bar and then hitting the synagogue on Saturday and talking to a few people, planting a seed of faith and moving on pretty quickly. That's uh, generally not what happened. Uh, Paul, for example, in one of his future missionary journeys will stay three whole years in Ephesus. Uh, so these were not just little brief visits. There are some of them that are cut short, like his visit to Thessalonica was interrupted. Um, he had to flee quickly uh, because of persecution. Now we see here that they made a good number of converts. Uh, they also a lot of people. They also made a lot of enemies, and the town is divided. And eventually, it gets so hot there that they got They got They have to. There's a plot to stone them, and they they leave there. They flee. Now, this is in conformity with Jesus, who says, look, you know, when the lion is chasing you, you don't got to jump into its mouth, um, that there is a time to flee persecution. Um, we can never deny Christ. If someone ever does finally catch up to you and say, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? You know, you have to say yes, even if they kill you for it. But it doesn't mean you can't evade them or try to run from them. So Jesus says, if they reject you in one town, flee to the next. Um, or he says on another occasion, if they reject you in one town, shake its dust and move from there, you see. So it's not like you're required to just kind of hit, you know, pound sand uh, forever or that you're required to utterly endanger yourself. Um, there is a value in living to fight another day. But there comes a time in the lives of martyrs where the, the final question just gets called and they can't evade it. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? And they had to say yes. Or will you burn incense to the emperor? And the answer has to be no. And even if they kill you for it. But if you can flee, it's okay. Get out. Okay? So I think that's uh, what you see an example of here. Uh, so Paul and Barnabas decide to live to fight another day and to preach another day. Okay. Now, um, we see here that uh, there, there is, a, we, we, we looked at this last week. So again, I'm, I'm going to just read this material rather quickly and just make a few comments to remind you. Now at Lystra, there was a man uh, sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. I'm going to guess he had maybe like club feet or gnarled feet that just, you know, you couldn't, he couldn't stand on them. I don't know. We don't know for sure. 
Uh, but he listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had the faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began to walk. Mm -hmm. So again, um, this word stand upright again is a, is a symbol for the resurrection, you know, anastasis, uh, be, be raised up, you know. Um, and so there is this vision of a um, kind of an image of the resurrection. He stood up and he started walking around freely. And this is an image of being set free from sin uh, and raised up from the dead, the spiritual death by the Lord. Now, um, he sprang up and began walking. Now, um, now, notice here, there's something interesting. Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had the faith to be healed. You know, I'm not so sure that I'm able to judge that when I see another person. You know, it's, just, it's hard to, to simply look at someone and know that. But I do know when I'm preaching that there are some who are getting the message and some who are like checked out. You know, um, and um, uh, I, I, uh, I find it very important to make eye contact with people when I'm teaching and preaching. Um, and uh, so like a lot of times here when we did these televised masses, I had to speak to an empty church. <laughs> it was kind of weird. But I wasn't getting any feedback, but um, I did the best I could. But I, I do sense something of that kind of faith when someone is, you can see they're getting it, the message. Not so much what I'm saying, but this message is from the Lord is touching them. And sometimes when, when it doesn't seem to be, but even there, I'm trying to be cautious because sometimes someone doesn't look like they're enjoying the message and they come up to me after mass and say, oh, that was wonderful. So I try to be careful not to quick, to make quick judgments on that. Okay, uh, I don't, so I don't know what Paul saw in him, but Paul then, you know, imagine the boldness of just looking at a, a crippled man and saying to him, in, in front of a big crowd, I say to you, get up and walk. I mean, if the Lord hadn't come through for him, he'd be a laughingstock. I mean, what kind of faith does that take to literally in front of a big group like that, just point to a lame man a, uh, who can't walk and tell him to get up and walk and presume that the Lord will take care of that for him. You know, it's like, wow. Uh, so all that's just a way of saying, um, um, you know, we, uh, we have this, um, you know, we have this um, amazing faith that Paul had, not so much in his own ability, but that God would work through him in this moment. So uh, there's a part of me that wishes I had that, but, you know, we all have different gifts and charisms. And I said to you before, I think there were special gifts given to the apostolic age. Okay, he says here, uh, when the crowd saw that Paul had done this, they lifted up their voices, saying, like an Owen, uh, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands and, uh, to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of nature like you. With you, we bring, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, we'll get on to this in a moment, but so you see that they tear their garments. That's a Jewish act of protest. Um, they rend their garments. Um, the... Um, don't underestimate, by the way, the costliness of that. For us, most clothing is inexpensive. But for them, you know, they would have maybe a few tunics or uh, like robes to wear, but uh, the things were expensive. And uh, most of the fabrics they had were not cotton and things like that. They were linen, and uh, linen is expensive. By the way, linen is wonderful. It's so cool to wear linen. It's just a very cooling garment. I'm convinced that part of the reason we hate the heat so much today is we uh, we're wearing plastic and uh, cotton mix mixes, you know, polyester and, and cotton, you know. And let's be honest, polyester is like wearing a plastic garbage bag, you know. It doesn't wrinkle, but it's like it doesn't breathe the same way uh, a linen garment. Oh, my goodness. I used to have some linen albs, and they were like heaven. You put them with like natural air conditioning. It's amazing. So just a little tip of the hat to linen if you ever want to buy some. Now, it wrinkles before you look at it. But the wrinkle is the look. <laughs> All right. At some point, it becomes so wrinkled that that's the look. So just set a new fashion trend. Okay. 
other. Now, um, uh, but they, they, they again try to instruct them, we're not gods. Now, here comes this, and we talked about this last time, but it's worth reviewing. Paul says, in past generations, God allowed the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave them without witnesses, for he did good by giving you rain from the heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying your heart with food and gladness. And even, when, even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice uh, to them. All right, now, um, um, I talked about this before, but remember there's the book of creation and the book of the scriptures. And the Jewish people had this special honor of receiving the book of scriptures, but as St. Paul says in Romans one, and I told you last time, because we were getting near the end of the class, I didn't have time to really look it up with you, but now I do want to look it up that Paul insists and the church insists and the entire wisdom tradition of the Bible, all the wisdom books insist that the Gentiles can come to know that God exists and at least know some of his qualities based on what he has made. So it goes like this. Uh, I'm reading now from Romans chapter one and verse 18 and following. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, listen to this, suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because he has shown it to them. He's talking about the Gentiles now, not the Jews. So again, let me start that again. For what can be known about God is plain to them, namely the Gentiles, because God has shown it to them. For his, in, in, for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, the Gentiles, are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, uh, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable sexual passions. Their women exchanged natural sexual relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they, the Gentiles, did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And it goes on from there. So you see that uh, what, what, the, what Paul is teaching, and he's drawing from a tradition in the Old Testament as well, is that although they don't have the, the full scriptures, the Gentiles do have the book of creation. And in creation, we observe that things have an order. They work to an end or a purpose. They have a purpose. Um, they're meant for certain things and not for other certain things. So if I were to... Um, I don't know, here's my magnifying glass, it has a purpose. But if I start to use it as a hammer, uh, it's, that's, it's not gonna do very good and it's gonna break. So um, um, things have a purpose, they have a, 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 something they're meant to be used for and things they're not meant to be used for. And uh, we observe these things in creation, we learn order and we learn that the God who made these therefore is a God of order. And we also learn basic moral norms. We know that, uh, that we, we, we learn that certain things create harmony in the human family and certain things create disorder and un, uh, disharmony. And we, we learn again that there are just certain things that uh, ought not to be done. And this is what's called the natural law. It's the law of God. It's the law of, uh, uh, that's available to our natural minds. It's not the law of nature per se. But it's, it's, the natural law is, is that part of the law which is perceivable by the human mind that observes creation and the purpose of things and is able to draw conclusions and understand who God is based on what he has made. Okay? 
Now, they may not have all the elements to the personal God that the rest of the book of Scripture provides, but they understand the basic qualities of God. Okay? So, um, any comments or questions about that? Because you see, today, it, it, because many have rejected the Scriptures, the church has also has recourse, though, to natural law arguments. However, uh, we're unfortunately very well deep into Romans 1, where people have debased their minds because they refuse to observe the order of creation that God himself has plainly done. They suppressed the truth. They suppress it. And they go into all kinds of confusion when this happens. And Paul emphasizes uh, that they started worshiping dogs and fish and birds and cats and bulls and goats, um, you know, worshiping lower things, worshiping them like they were gods or worshiping the sun, even higher things, but still just a creature. Um, and they, lo they lose their way. And then they, their, their debased mind gets very confused about the purpose of things like sexuality. You know, uh, God intends for sex and marriage and making children to be together. And in our foolishness, we separate what God has joined and all kinds of confusion comes pouring forth. And you heard all the descriptions of homosexual acts and other debased uh, acts, sexual acts um, and, and, and things that flow from this. And just, well, welcome to the 21st century. I mean, you know, when it comes to this, this is what happens when you kick God to the curb uh, and uh, um, you, you lose your way pretty quickly, see? Okay, so not to belabor the point, but Paul's making this point, that God, again, in the past generations, he allowed the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without a witness. For he did good by giving you rains from the heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts, with food and gladness, but even with these words, they were scarcely restrained from being claimed to be gods. But again, so Paul's tapping into that tradition that says God speaks through and in what he has made, okay? <clears throat> I think I mentioned this to you before. How does God create? He speaks, right? He sends forth a word, let there be light. And there's light. And it, that word is, the word is logos in Greek. And we find out in the New Testament that in, in, uh, um, in, in Arche Hologos, and Hologos says proston theon. That is to say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Mm -hmm. And all things came into being through him, and nothing that exists did not come into being through him. So I'm just summarizing the prologue to John's Gospel. So this word is not just a sound that God the Father utters, it's the second person of the Trinity. So God the Father creates, but he creates everything through his son, the Logos. And um, this Logos impresses a logike on creation, a logic. So God thought creation into being. Uh, one can, uh, creation is not just dumbly there. Um, it's the whole root of the scientific method that creation isn't just dumbly here. It actually has an order and a purpose. It has things to teach us, and we learn from its order how we are to live and who made it, okay? So that's the whole basic, you know, kind of logos theology that uh, started out in the um, Old Testament and what's called the wisdom tradition books, the wisdom books, like uh, the book of wisdom, the book of Sirach, the book of Proverbs, um, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes and so on. These are the wisdom books that all speak to this idea that God speaks in creation. I know I'm beating the horse, but I uh, just wanna make sure that even people today without who have very little truck with the scriptures have no excuse because they're, there, there's an order that's perceptible in creation. Sex has a meaning and a purpose, and you suppress the truth and you go off track very fast. So do other things have a meaning and a purpose, and you, you worship them as gods or you use them inappropriately and you go off track very quickly, okay? All right, enough said. Now, this, come, this next place um, is where we ended last time. The Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, uh, remember these, they came from the, the previous town and they stirred up the crowds and they dragged them out of the city, supposing that he was dead. And um, when the disciples, so they, uh, 
they, I'm sorry, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around about him, he rose up and they went back and they went entered the city. And the next day they went on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And notice this now, and when they had appointed presbyters for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So they make this cycle and they go back through those towns. Notice it's interesting, some of those towns where they had been stoned or thrown out of the city or had threats against them, but they went back through those towns and they met again with the disciples and strengthened them. And they, they, they said, it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Um, pay attention to that. You know, we live in a time where I think, you know, we've been able to eliminate a lot of discomforts. We live very comfortably in, it, in many ways. We have air conditioning, we have, uh, we have electricity, running water, fresh, pure water. I mean, pure water was hard to come by. Um, we have eyeglasses, we have medicine, we have so many things that make our life so much easier. Um, that I think that even the smallest little setbacks just were filled with resentments very quickly, you know. Our immediate ancestors didn't see life that way. They spoke more like this. It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. So you, you, you may have heard me use this example before, but because it's a prayer we all know pretty well. Um, Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we, notice, cry, poor, banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. And it goes on to say that we're living in this exile. Now, you see, we don't write prayers like that much anymore. <laughs> but, you know, the honest truth is that we are in exile. And that, that this world is not our home. And there's a lot of discomforts. And there's tribulation. And there are trials and setbacks. And this is a time of, very often of testing and pain for us. And, but, but I think because we're so used to having everything comfortable and easily fixed. And all of our movies fixed everything in 90 minutes. You know, the crisis sets in, our hero arrives on the scene, and after about 90 minutes of killing people, blowing up buildings, and breaking things, he comes to the final showdown with the unambiguously evil man, uh, kills him, uh, takes the girl in his arm, and burning sitting in the background, roll credits. And it's all done in 90 minutes. Crisis averted, you know. And uh, that's just not the way life works. And some of our sufferings can go on for a long, long time. And this is not, this is a time that is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. A lot of those old Protestant hymns talked about kind of almost a longing for death. You know, one bright morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Another song says, trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us that blessed promised land. But he guides us with his eye and we follow till we die. And we'll understand it better by and by. Oh, by and by when the morning comes and all the saints of God are gathered home, we'll tell the story of how we've overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. We don't write a lot of hymns like that anymore. But you know, those were written by people who knew real suffering, who worked in coal mines and in factories six days a week. 10 hours a day, who had very poor salaries, uh, poor health, lived in tenements. Some of them ran the rails across this country, um, did terrible, hard, painful work. Life was brutal and life was short. And um, death was gain. And we just, we've lost that sense. And so I think happens because suffering still does come to us. But there's something we're particularly resentful about it because we expect that life should be peachy. And it's not. It's not. Um, we're in exile. So I don't mean to sound too gloomy. There are beautiful things in life. And even our ancestors had beautiful moments. There were times of weddings and celebrations and parties. And there were times and holidays and saints feasts. But there was also a lot more obvious hardship that they encountered. 
And just think of all the medicine, you know, you get diarrhea back, you know, a hundred years ago and you'd be dead by the end of the week. Dehydration, you know, if you couldn't stop that. See, so, I mean, these are the kinds of things we just take for granted to get the emodium and be done with it, you know? So you, you see that um, we live pretty well, but it creates for us a kind of a quick resentment when anything goes wrong, even a small thing like my, my cell phone is slow, you know, and we're always going to law, you know, over things. And um, so anyway, um, all right, we'll leave it at that. But the next thing I want to point out to you, though, in this is a very important line. It says here uh, in um, verse 27, and when they arrived and gathered the church together, Notice that word, the church, is used there, right? They gathered the church uh, together and declared that what God had... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in the wrong line. Um, um, verse 23 of Acts 15. And when they had appointed elders, or it says here presbyters for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So you notice the appointed presbyters. Now this word presbyter can be translated elder or priest. And I, I guess you can sort of tell how priest is kind of a mispronunciation of presbyter, you know? So down through the centuries, as it came into English, you know, presbyter, presbyter, little priest, you know? So uh, it, it's just sort of morphs over time into the word priest in English. Um, don't, when it says elder, don't just think older people, because it's an office, and they lay hands on elder uh, presbyters in other passages that you'll see. Um, so it isn't necessarily a recognition of mere chronological age, but that certain people, whether they're older or a little bit younger, but they receive this office. It's an office. It's not just a status because you've reached 60 or whatever, okay? Yeah. Monsignor, um, is the the root of that type of priest the same as like the pre pagan priest from like the pagan religions? Would that, that have been a different word? You know, I don't know that. I thought you were going to ask whether that term priest, you know, we use the word priest in two senses in the church, don't we? Um, let me answer your question first. I don't know. I don't know what the pagan, um, I do know there's two Greek words for priest. One is um, a presbyter, and the other is hierus, where we get the word hierarchy. What is hierarchy? Archon means rule, and hierus means priest. So hierarchy literally means rule by priest. Um, the, um, in, it, it's, so I, I don't really honestly know the answer, whether the, I don't know pagan Greek enough to say that, yeah, that's the word they used, okay? I will say this, that um, in the Catholic tradition, we do have, we use the word priest in two distinct but related senses. Every baptized Christian has the office of priest, prophet, and king, right? What does a priest do? A priest offers sacrifice, okay, uh, in atonement for sins, uh, their own and others. Now, um, What's interesting about the New Testament priesthood is that the priest and the victim are one and the same. In the Old Testament, the priest would sacrifice something different from himself, an animal or maybe a, a libation of oil, but it wasn't himself. But in the New Testament, in the New Testament, the, um, the, um, uh, the priest offers him very self because Jesus is the great high priest. Now, every baptized Christian is, has what's called the royal priesthood of all believers. So you, as Catholics and Christians, are called to offer sacrifice, sacrifice of praise, but ultimately the sacrifice of your very self to God. Here I am, Lord, use me, work through me, I'm yours. Now there is also what we call in the Catholic tradition the ministerial priesthood, and that's what, like, what, what I mean, what, what Ben is training for. But we uh, are, are called priests and we minister the sacraments um, uh, essentially, and we also preach and teach, you know, we have the office of teach to govern and to sanctify, okay, uh, the whole body of Christ, or, or that, that part of Christ, namely a parish that's given to us to oversee. Um, so that's what we call the ministerial priesthood, okay, and the book of Hebrews develops that um, a great deal, the ministerial priesthood, okay, Okay, so I, that 
Yeah. And uh, if I if I if I can jump, I actually in other languages you still use the word in the prayers of mass. You say the word presbytero. Yeah. Presbyteros um, instead of prison. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think like it would refer more to like this. Um, mm-hmm. But now that you mentioned the priesthood of all believers, I wanted to ask you actually, Monsignor, because that's one of the things that my Protestant friends actually like have a an mm-hmm. issue with about Catholic priests. Like they say that we can all be. You know, yeah, the, it's the priest of, of all believers, and the Bible says so and stuff. So I'm just trying to like, I've always, yeah, I'm just trying to, yeah, to understand how we can like talk to them about that. Well, I think you have to start with the calling of the first priest. Um, who were they? Well, they were the apostles. So Christ called the twelve apostles, these men, and he gave certain things that only they were to do. Um, for example, only they, only the apostles are told to baptize. Only the apostles are told to confect the Eucharist. Only the apostles are given the power to forgive sins. He doesn't give these powers to all the disciples in general. So among the many disciples, Jesus chose 12 men whom he named apostles. And he gave them certain powers that only they could do. All right? Um, and so these are the things that he, he would say to them, he who hears you hears me. He said that to the apostles, not to all the disciples. He gave them authority to teach in his name. He did not give that to all the disciples. So these would be, that's where I would begin. Uh, I wouldn't get into too long of a debate about the priesthood of all the believers because we accept that in the Catholic church, but we distinguish it from the ministerial priesthood, which draws its authority from the calling of the apostles, who then laid hands on people and appointed people to represent them at three levels, whether as a bishop, as a uh, priest, or as a deacon, okay? And we see, therefore, in this passage, how before they left these towns, they didn't leave them alone. They appointed a leader whom they called the presbyter, okay? And and, and the, they, they were to care for that church okay and we're going to see that in another journey paul and barnabas come in and check in on them okay so there's accountability so i think that's the best place the priesthood the of the ministerial priesthood takes its origin from the call of the apostles okay and it's demonstrable that there were things given to the only that to them to do all right Mm -hmm. okay thank you now we come then to uh where they return now uh, would somebody want to just pick up reading here um, at verse 24? Okay, Kate. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in per- Perga, they went down to Atalia. From there, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been commanded or commended to the grace of God for the work that they had completed. When they arrived, they called the church together and related all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith for the Gentiles. And they stayed there with the disciples for some time. Okay, there's that vague, (laughs) that vague time. And my translation said they remained there for no little time. (laughs) <laughs> All right. So it's also vague. I want to put up the map again. Uh, let me see if I can share that. Uh, oh, of course, it's playing with me now. Hang on a second. It was so easy last week. Um, we don't want to do that. Okay, I want to do bring this up here. Okay. La di da di da. Okay, now make it a little bit larger, and now I want to share the screen. Okay, so you see that uh, there they do kind of the with the round up there in the Iconium Lystra Derby at the, at the middle of the map there, in Galatia. Uh, so by by the way, when Paul writes to the letter to the Galatians, it's to these towns that he's writing, like the Iconian, the Lystra, and the Derby you know, Antioch, Pisidia. So they work their way back down to the port city of Perga and Italia, and they get on a boat there and they go back to Antioch, all right? Through the, through the port there called Seleucia. All right, now, notice though that they don't just come back and uh, say, well, that was cool. Uh, they report to the church. Uh, 
and, and it's important because there needs to be accountability in the church. Remember, Paul and Barnabas were commissioned to, to, do, to do this mission. Um, and now they're reporting back to the church that commissioned them, uh, namely the church at Antioch, and they're making a report. And yes, it's a very celebratory report, but it's, it's about accountability. And this is one of the things that, um, you know, every year I'm certainly required to render an account for certain things that are going on in this parish. Uh, everything from a financial report to the numbers of baptisms, weddings, funerals, um, and other aspects of parish life um, that I'm expected to send to the diocese, you know, every, every year. Uh, there is accountability. Uh, now, I, I wish I could say that they kept their eye on all those things perfectly. As you know, we've been through a kind of a scandal, like a big one, where there hasn't been the kind of accountability uh, that there should be. Um, so I think that um, we, um, we don't do it perfectly well, but there, is, there are aspects of accountability. Another form of it is I'm a dean and I oversee 12 parishes and in better times than these before the plague, I'm expected to go and visit those 12 parishes, look in their books, make sure they're recording sacraments properly, talk to the staff. Um, I'm a kind of a buffer so that if a parishioner at one of those parishes has a problem, they pick up the phone and they call me. And if it's more serious, I remand it to the diocese or I might just give the pastor a call and say, Father, stick to the rubrics, you know, don't play around with the mass. Um, uh, if you do, I'll have to talk to the bishop. <laughs> but, you know, that doesn't happen. I, I don't get lots of calls, but every now and again, you know, a parishioner will be concerned about a priest at their parish that I oversee as a dean. And uh, one of the local bishops or the uh, auxiliary bishops oversees me and the other deans. So this is these kind of levels of accountability. I just had a finance council meeting. Um, I'm accountable to you parishioners here, to all our parishioners, um, for how your money is spent. And I, I, I am required to report to and render an account to the finance council. Um, we as a, di as a parish are required to re publish financial reports to the diocese and to the people of God. So these are examples of accountability. And it's important because if, if there isn't accountability, things start to get pretty weird pretty fast. And um, you can't keep your eye on idiosyncrasies and things that start to develop in the church, and whether in the liturgy or in the, uh, the way their uh, parish is administered. So the priest starts doing funny stuff with the money and not good. So th there's lots of structures that keep the money out of the priest hands. Um, I was talking to Ben yesterday, you know, the, the, when the collection is taken up, it goes right into a tamper evident bag from the ushers who put it in the drop safe and that is opened by the counters and they open and no money touches the pastor's hands. That is never to touch my hands. And that's just a safeguard for both me and for the parishioners. Because, you know, I sit on top of a pretty hefty budget of a lot of money. And I could, uh, you know, if I didn't know that there weren't people watching, you know, and I was dishonest, I don't know, I could siphon off money and, you know, people might not notice. So these are reasons that because of sin that we need to stay accountable to each other. Okay. It's sometimes irritating, uh, but at the end of the day, it's kind of necessary. All right. So, all right. So there's accountability here, okay? Now, before we go into the next chapter, uh, any comments or questions on the things we've covered so far? I guess it, Meredith, are you about to unmute there? No, looks like you are, okay. No, I'm here. I'm just, I was checking something. Oh, okay, all right, I'm I thought here. you were pressing unmute. Okay. Well, I think that, uh, again, so accountability, take it, uh, you know, as a, you know, we all have to, uh, you know, I guess, you know, our two doctors here, you know, you have to meet certain boards and requirements and do certain training and stay caught up. You know, uh, we priests are required to also do certain, you know, training every year and different things. I, can, I guess most of you in your professional development, you're, you're required to do some of these things and to be accountable for those kinds of things. And I think all these are examples of, generally speaking, of a good, healthy accountability that, that keeps us all more honest and more hardworking. Okay, good. All right, now we're going to come into some trouble. And to use the word racism, um, it kind of takes a, a, a modern American word and pushes it back into a more ancient setting where the context is different, but the reality is pretty much still the same. 
the way the Jewish people saw the world was you had, you had the Jews and then there was everybody else. And they were called the Gentiles or the Goyim. And um, Goyim is very too closely related to the Hebrew word for also for pig. Um, and sometimes they would play on the word and refer to them as the pigs. Um, it is not right to take the food of children and throw, or, I'm sorry, uh, do not throw your pearls before swine, you know, uh, these kinds of images. Um, so um, a lot of ugliness. Um, now the Gentiles, of course, returned the favor. Um, but among the things that would just be unconscionable for a Jew to do, and we talked a little bit about it already back in chapters 10 and 11, was it would be unconscionable for a Jew to enter the house of a Gentile. A stinking Gentile, by the way, I might add. Huh? Um, and, and they would not cross the threshold of the door of any Gentile. And if they did, they became ritually unclean. Now, what's interesting is you come to a, a very a dramatic moment where Jesus is on trial. And he, they take him to the Praetorium, which is the palace of the governor. And he takes Jesus into the house. But the, 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 the priests who are making the charges won't go in because they don't want to defile themselves by going into the house of a Gentile so that they won't be able to celebrate the Passover feast. Now, do you, do you hear the irony and the hypocrisy about that? They are putting an innocent man to death. They're committing deicide and they're worried about ritual impurity. You know? I mean, John is, is just dripping with Joe and I in irony, you know just dripping with it. Um, so you start to see that, uh, there's, shall, shall we say they are majoring in all the minors? <laughs> they're maximizing the minimum and minimizing the maximum, okay? Uh, this is, they got it all backwards. All right, but the point is I'm making to you is that a Jew would never touch something uh, that a Gentile, uh, you know, I mean, they had to touch a few things, but like a utensil or they would never share bowls or cups or kettles or anything related to eating. If, if a Gentile had ever touched it, it was defiled forever. Um, they would never, uh, you know, the occasion, if you can make a little money in a transaction, of course, you'd work with a Gentile. But at the end of the day, uh, Gentiles were, were to be avoided. Uh, they were hated by the Jews and the Gentiles returned the favor. You may also remember that the Samaritan woman protests. How is it that you, a Jew, uh, and a man speak to me, a Samaritan and a woman. And then it says in parentheses, for, Je for Jews and Samaritans have nothing together. Um, and she's very nasty and re resentful that this Jew, this stinking Jew is talking to her, a Samaritan. And uh, Jesus doesn't take the bait. He stays in a conversation with her. And she eventually warms up to the conversation and the rest is history. But um, I tell you, um, if you haven't seen the series, The Chosen, and by the way, here in the parish, we're going to do that in a couple of weeks, and I have a little showing of the a couple of episodes of The Chosen. Uh, so if you want to find out more, I know Joy, uh, who was on earlier, is helping to organize that. But anyway, all that shit, the, the episode on the Samaritan woman is very beautiful. It's a particularly beautiful episode. But here you have then the problem now that Gentiles are coming into the church and they're, they're alongside Jewish Christians who largely have maintained their Jewishness. They still dress like Jews. They eat kosher. They celebrate Jewish feast. Uh, um, they still have a lot of these attitudes towards Gentiles and uh, Gentiles are basically unclean people. They eat unclean food. They're, they're just kind of stinking people. And all of a sudden you're being asked to sit down at a service together with these Gentiles and, and intermingle with them or sit at table with them? Oh, no. No. And so there arises a crisis. So let's have you, um, um, let, let, let's, let's have you, Kate, if you could continue into chapter 15 here. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. Okay, so stop there. Now, um, uh, maybe I'll put the map back up for a minute. It's an unusual expression from our point of view, um, that um, 
um, share my screen here. Okay, can you can you see the map here? I see. Oh, I got to share it. Okay, we okay with the map? Now they're up there in Antioch, and it says that some Jews came down from Judea. Now Judea is down here near. See where Jerusalem is on the map? That's Judea. In our mind, in modern American, we think you go up to Antioch because it's north. You go up if you're going north, and you go down if you're going south. But you always go down from Jerusalem. <laughs> it's always downhill from Jerusalem. First of all, it was, it was a higher mountain peak. But, but the point is that um, you're, you, whenever you leave Jerusalem, you're going down from there. Okay, So that, that image of going down to Antioch, in our mind, we think, no, they're going north, they're going up. But, but that's just a way of speaking. It's different than, than it is now. Okay. All right. I'll just take the map off here now again. Um, okay. Now you're back to my ugly mug. Okay. Now, uh, it says here that uh, they came from Judea, uh, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised, you, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, you, you, you and I might think of circumcision as just this little surgery performed on a little boy, an eight day old boy, where some of the foreskin of the penis is cut and um, away. Um, it is a surgery, but that's not really its main point. You now become subject to the entire Jewish way of life, the entire Jewish law. You become a Jew by that. Um, women are more naturally Jews, but, but a, a boy has to be made a Jew. He's circumcised. And when he is circumcised, again, he takes up the whole culture, the whole customs and the laws of the Jewish people. The ceremonial precepts, the, the, the obligation to keep the feast, all the requirements, the ritual requirements of purity, all these things come upon you. So this is not just a little surgery that needs to be done so you can be saved. You, in effect, can only be saved by becoming a Jew and following the law, the Jewish law. Okay. Now, Paul would later write in the letter to the Galatians, if salvation comes through observance of the law, then Jesus died to no purpose. If you and I could just do extra spiritual push-ups and keep certain rules and be saved that way, we don't need Christ. See? And the fact of the matter is that, uh, again, it was, so it was basically a denial of the necessity of salvation by and through the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, there, there's a, they had a huge debate about it. And it says here, there arose no small dissension. Um, so this became quite a fight. Uh, so in effect, what these Jewish Christians were arguing, these were Jewish Jews who had converted to Christianity, were arguing is, these Gentile converts need to live and sound and act and be like Jews, uh, adopting our customs, our kosher diet, all of our other customary laws, the festivals and the feast. They have to put on the prayer shawl and the phylacteries and pray like they have, they, they have to do all of this to be admitted into the church. Okay. Now let's put that in modern terms. It's like, you know, people have different ethnic customs and traditions that ought to be respected. And, you know, let's just put it in modern terms. Let's say that uh, some African Americans moved into an area and uh, they, they wanted to go to the Catholic Church and said, well, don't bring any of that stupid gospel music in here. We don't do that kind of stuff around here. You need to act like us and re receive the liturgy just like us. We're not going to allow your kind of diversity here. That would be, you know, again, something where the church permits diversity. And then we say that this, this can't be done. You have to act and be like us. That is ultimately a form of, of uh, racial or ethnic um, um, hatred. Uh, there's other customs, you know. Um, why do those crazy Mexicans do that, uh, those coins at the wedding? What's that all about? Get rid of that. You know? I mean, we can be like that, you see. And we want everyone to just be and act and sound like us. And there's, there, there, there are limits to diversity. But there's a very legitimate diversity, see? And they didn't want any of this. If these stupid, stinking Gentiles have to be in our church with us, why do we ever do this? Look at the headache, man. You know, they at least let them live like us and get rid of all those ugly, stupid customs that they have and the terrible food they're eating and 
the filthy stuff that they eat, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you see the vision here. Cultures are clashing. And uh, it's, a type of a, it's a type of racism or ethnic strife, you see. All right. So what do they do? And here comes a very important moment. And the church has done this ever since. When there's a crisis among the leaders of the church that can't be resolved by the leaders, then there is something that is done where a council is called. Where the, where the Pope or Peter presides, or Peter's successor, in other words, the Pope. And these things are debated and hashed out in the council. And, and there comes a, a, um, a decision that's made by the council, ratified by the Pope, and a letter is sent out with the results or the teaching, um, uh, and, and, and the matter is considered to be resolved. All right? Now, that, that's what's going to happen here. We're going to see all those elements. So let's get started. Um, it's so, getting so Monsignor, do the Jews still believe salvation comes from the law? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, when, Kenneth, when, when you ask the question, what do the Jews think about something today? It's like saying, what does a Protestant think? There's so many varieties of them, <laughs> you know, that, um, uh, you know, in a way they can't even keep their law anymore because the temple is gone. Um, I, I think that they would argue that you know, one can and should be saved through observances. But you're going to find that they're um, like the Reformed Jews and uh, the so-called conservative Jews, they're not really conservative at all, are very lax, whereas you have uh, the uh, Orthodox Jews and, and some of the other um, uh, branches of the Orthodox Jews that are very strict about the law. Uh, you must do these things or you can't be saved. So it depends on what kind of a Jew you're talking about, all right? Um, so uh, that's about the best I can do in answering it. You know, it's like, what do Protestants think about X? Well, there's like 30 different thousand denominations, you know, and they uh, sometimes fight among each other with those very things. So anyway, that would be about the best I can do. Okay. Now, Kate, you want to continue there with uh, verse, um, uh, you might as well start with verse two again. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem... By the way, Phoenicia is modern-day Lebanon, and Samaria is kind of the middle part of Israel today, okay? Wait, when they came? When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of, of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, my brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of, Lord Je of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done among, through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favor favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it and I will set it, set it up so that all other peoples may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. 
Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city, for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogue. Okay, now... Um... So there's a great debate. I, I love the way, uh, you know, the paucity of words. Uh, um, after much debate, <laughs> Peter rose. So you can imagine the yelling and screaming back and forth, the rending of garments, the throwing of dust in the air, the tomatoes and eggs flying back and forth. And, you know, <laughs> you can imagine quite a rip-roaring debate. It would seem, now I'm reading into this a little bit, but that James was probably of the party of the uh, uh, that that w w wanted them to live like Jews, so uh, he later asked for some concessions, as we'll see. But in the midst of all this debate, finally Peter rose and he made a decision, and the whole assembly grew silent. And his decision was that we should not ask them to take on the whole yoke of the law that neither we who are or our ancestors could really keep. Um, some Jews prided themselves in keeping the law. But they kept it in a very perfunctory way, you know. And um, so, again, uh, he's making that point that it's, it's pretty hard to keep the law. Now, um, we come then to this um, moment, though, uh, where then Paul and Barnabas are, to, are asked to tell the story of the conversion of these Gentiles. And they do. And, they, and James finally, who, again, would, would seem to have been opposite Peter in his point of view, arises and affirms Peter's decision. And he also makes an additional judgment. He says, I would like to ask, or he just says, it's my decision or my thought that we should, um, that we should uh, simply ask that they do a few things. And he asked for things that seem very arbitrary. Um, but uh, on, only one of them is really strictly speaking a moral issue. Um, we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols. Okay, in other words, um, um, food or whatever that had been sacrificed to idols or bought in, in, in pagan temples. Uh, and from sexual immorality and from what has been uh, meat that has been strangled and from meat with blood in it. Okay, and he gives the reason, he says, that all throughout the Jewish world, these things are observed. And if we're going to have any peace at a meal with Gentiles, we just ask them to please refrain from eating red meat. Uh, and it's just so disgusting to us. Uh, so for the sake of just social order, uh, you know, he asked for these concessions, all right? Even later on, uh, some of these concessions gave way. Paul has a whole section in Romans where he, he says that, look, if, if this upsets your brother, um, about eating this meat like this, then don't eat it. But there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it, okay? So what James is really asking for here are just some concessions. Now, when he says that they abstain from fornication, some of the translations say from illicit marriage. Uh, I don't know what some of your translations say. Um, the, um, of course, everybody's required to do that, and that's still a requirement. Um, but... Um, the, the problem was that the Gentiles and the Jews had different notions about who could marry who. Um, so uh, there were a lot of weird setups in the Gentile world, you know, like where son married his mother, weird stuff like that, or first cousins were getting married. And, you know, so anyway, these were the things that Jewish people did not accept as valid or lawful marriage. So um, they had to work out uh, who could really marry who. And the Jews were more strict on that than the Gentiles, all right? And Jesus also mentions that, by the way, in Matthew 19. Um, he says, whoever, get, whoever divorces his wife and marries another, I'm ex and the, with the exception of this, these illicit marriages, um, he commits adultery. So uh, the Lord himself even mentioned the illicit marriages that were common among the Gentiles, where people much too close in the bloodline for getting married, okay? Now, um, Therefore, um, and we don't have time to read it all tonight, we'll just, I just want to read the opening couple lines of the letter uh, to you. Um, and um, 
it has a very interesting phrase. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But first of all, you see, though, we have a huge problem where Jews are upset that some Gentiles are coming in as Gentiles. Uh, there are racial tensions and strife and difficulty. It, it's sort of the Jews are presented as the bad guy here, but I have feelings that there were probably a lot of animosity going both directions. Um, and um, this needed to be resolved. How are we going to learn to, what, what are the boundaries? How do we get along? What is required? What isn't? Uh, what lifestyle things need to be followed? What's of the moral law? What's just of custom? You know, and all of these things had to be sorted out. And even the leaders didn't agree. So James, the party of James, now why do I say James was of a different mind? Because Paul would later refer to the party of James as, as being the troublemakers. So later on in his letters, Paul mentions the party of James as being these Judaizers who kept coming and insisting. And so Peter overruled James and James then rose and asked for concessions and that a letter be sent forth, all right? Now, this is a very interesting thing. It's very Catholic, and we still do this today. When the church is in crisis, the bishops of, the, of, the, of that location of the world, as many can come, come, and they meet, and the Pope is with them, and they debate this. We had a lot of councils in the early church that had to have, hammer out doctrines on the Trinity, on, the, on, on Christology, on the nature of Christ. Um, they had to, uh, and there were great debates back and forth, and at the end, they would hammer out an answer, and the Pope would ratify it, and boom, you got some new doctrine, see? Uh, we've done this down through the centuries. The most recent council was the Second Vatican Council, which didn't do a lot of major doctrinal in innovations, um, but reiterated them in a, in a way that the modern age could maybe hear a little more clearly. Um, and it was a controversial council. Most of them are, by the way. Um, but that's the most recent council, all right? And the, the people say, well, there was no big crisis going on in the church. Why was it called? And there was a big crisis going on. In Europe, the faith is, was dying on the vine. I mean, a few vast numbers of people had left the church. Now, in America, the church was still booming through the 50s and 60s. But after the Second World War, the church in Europe was falling to pieces. And there was a sense of crisis that we've got to get together and, you know, uh, articulate the faith in a way that um, we can bring people back to an understanding of the coherence of faith. So that was the crisis, see, all right? Now, all that said, um, at the end of this council, all these things being worked out, a letter is sent forth, all right? Now, I just want to read the first couple lines and we'll leave the rest for next week, all right? Then it's, this seemed good to the apostles and the elders, or presbyters, huh, with the whole church to choose men from among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. And here the letter begins. The brothers, both the apostles and the presbyters, uh, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no such instructions, it seems good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved brother Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth, for it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, and namely that you abstain from what was been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Okay. Now, uh, I, what I wanted to emphasize is I love this line. It seems to us and to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, in other words, they see a real authority in what took place in that council that the Holy Spirit had guided them in that council to come to this decision. And so this isn't just a bunch of guys got together and hammered out a compromise, but it seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit to not lay any extra burdens on you. So we'll return to this letter next week. But um, I, I just want to say that uh, there is um, a beauty in this that they felt guided by the Holy Spirit. And somewhere along the line, we have to trust that when the church officially comes together in council, 
uh, that there is a gift of the Holy Spirit given. Not to say that everything that a council says or utters or everything that happens there uh, is infallible and perfect and there's never any problems, but that overall the process is guided by the Holy Spirit for the good of the church. And this is uh, an act of trust in God. So yes, we guys got together, had a few beers, hammered out the problems, um, and um, uh, came up with the decision. But it wasn't just us. The Holy Spirit assisted us. So, so you see this vision, okay? All right. Well, let's, let's finish there for tonight. We'll pick up again with that letter. Uh, Fanny, if you can help me remember that next week at the... Uh, all right, and uh, before we uh, end, are there comments or questions? We live in a time where a lot of people, uh, they're a minority in the church, but they're rather vocal, have their doubts about the Second Vatican Council. Um, and um, I would not be among them. I, I think that the council did kind of get hijacked after the council. A lot of things were said and done in the name of the council that were incorrect, but if you actually read the documents that were produced, they're very carefully written. Uh, they have some very beautiful things to say. Uh, they develop certain doctrines in a way that's uh, consonant with um, uh, our understanding today. Um, uh, there's One could maybe reasonably argue that the document on religious liberty was something of an innovation, um, but I don't see that as imp 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 impacting too heavily on the central doctrines of the church. It's just, how does, the, how does the church interact in a pluralistic culture? Um, we have much more pluralistic cultures today than we ever did in the past. And so the church kind of changed her tactics on, and developed the doctrine or the teaching, I should say more, on religious liberty, okay? Something that's enshrined in our constitution is the first right you got from the Bill of Rights, right? So uh, relate to, uh, you know, a, a right to religious liberty. Now, um, but as I say, there are many debates, and of course, there's a lot of liturgical changes that came in the wake of the council, some of which the council seems to have called for. But again, many of these liturgical innovations went much further than the documents actually say. For example, the documents say that it never envisioned that Latin would wholly disappear from the liturgy, but rather that the use of the vernacular could be expanded, but that the use of the Latin language, other things being equal, should also be retained in the liturgy. It praised Gregorian chant and organ music. It praised Renaissance polyphony. Uh, it didn't say throw all that stuff away and you should get guitars and sing. It did allow and per permit greater diversity in music. That is true. But you see, you want to distinguish some of what happened from what was actually taught and said. And some of these things got hijacked in a time of great revolution which the late 60s certainly were. So I would encourage you to have faith that the basic teachings of the council are good, they're intact. They, they build on what the church has always taught. And um, later on, some people just chose to distort or take these teachings in a different direction, but the teachings themselves in the actual documents are solid, okay? It seems to us and to the Holy Spirit, you know, da, 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 da. okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's finish then with prayer. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we see so many Catholic elements in this, in this Acts of the Apostles. Um, we see bishops, priests, we see deacons, we see accountability structures, we see the role of Peter in leadership. We, we see how there was the first council of the church and all of these are Catholic ways um, and Catholic things. Um, so we thank you, Lord, uh, that we see so much of what's running in today and, and the very roots of this first, first generation in the church. They were already there. So thank you, Lord, for this. And now bless, uh, bless the church. Uh, we're in a time of crisis in many places in the world, and we do ask your mercy upon the church and upon all who gather in your holy name. Jesus, you who are Lord forever and ever. Amen. All right, well, listen, bless you all. And if you want to unmute and say bye-bye, you can. You can just wave, and uh, <laughs> good to see you all, and we'll plan for next Monday. All right? Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Monsignor. Thank you, Matt.